Good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm the dean of the Institute of Design. My name is Anijo Matthew. Uh, but we have a very special guest today to open the, um, the event. Uh, the provost of the university, Professor Ken Christensen, is here. So I want to hand over the mic to um, uh, Professor Christensen, uh, Provost Christensen, to open the event for us tonight. Um, Ken? I don't often these days uh, get referred to as a professor, so I appreciate that, Anicho. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to the Illinois Institute of Technology, our Mies campus. Uh, for those of you that uh, maybe this is uh, one of the few times you've been here, we're an institution that's about opportunity and providing educational opportunities for individuals from all walks of life. And we're very proud of this mission of being that opportunity engine. And, uh, and where we sit today is a reflection of that as well. The Institute of Design you know, is really looking at new ways to create change within the world, right? Uh, we're going to hear today about equity. Uh, ID, since its founding in 1937, is the first college of design here in the United States, is really focused on how do you turn design into a powerful tool that can be used by all, and for purposes that range from product development to process development to creating and remo or removing barriers to access and to development and to success. And so we're really proud of the fact that Illinois Tech is home to such a wonderful community of design. Um, the graduates here use design to transform the systems that shape our lives. And so you'll see that represented uh, within the work that's done in ID, from cities, education, and finance, to food, healthcare, and technology. And again, we're the only US design school that is uh, focused solely on graduate students. And we're also the first to offer a PhD uh, in design. So again, we're very proud of that history. We're very proud of the culture in ID. And uh, we're very proud of the fact that its purpose and its mission really aligns with that of the broader university and our community. So I want to take a moment to thank the family and friends of Lucas Daniel for making this evening possible. Your gift helps us build new knowledge around sustainable design and systems. And for your long-standing support, we're deeply appreciative uh, for events like this. Well, thank you very much. So today our invited lecturer, Cheryl Kababa, considers how we can use systems thinking and design as we pursue equity. So now I'd like to introduce ID Associate Professor Moore Shea, who co-directs our Food Systems and Action Lab, and she will also moderate our Q&A session after Cheryl's talk. Maura? Welcome. So glad you're all here. Really excited for this evening, and thank you for coming. For those of you online, hello. We're glad you're here, too. I'm Maura Shea. I'm an associate professor here at ID and the co-director of the Food Systems Action Lab with my buddy, Wesland. There you are, Wesleyan. Hi, Wesleyan. Um, and we are uh, really honored here to be hosting Cheryl tonight for this exciting discussion about systems thinking and design. Uh, this lecture is named for my friend, Lucas Daniel, uh, who shared with us this commitment to design and the systems and sustainability of all systems. Uh, this is our sixth annual lecture in this series, uh, the Lucas J. Daniel Lecture in Sustainable Systems. This series was, as we mentioned, made possible by the friends and family of Lucas J. Daniel, who graduated from ID in 2005. Um, in the ID Action Labs for food systems, we are focused on si shifting food systems toward more sustainable and equitable structures and practices. We're specifically focused on the areas of food procurement for public institutions, as well as for food waste prevention, two key levers in systems change. Um, but these are system. These are um, enorm These systems are enormous drivers of inequity and greenhouse gas emissions, and call for really creative and consequential transformation. 
And so, as a graduate school here in design, we are both thoughtful and experimental about these interventions that we need to design and build today and in order to achieve the systems that we all want for tomorrow. We were really excited that Cheryl accepted our invitation to come and speak here because she too embodies thoughtfulness and experimentation. Cheryl Kababa is the author of Closing the Loop, Systems Thinking for Design. She drives an equity-centered design practice as the chief strategy officer at Substantial. It's a research insights and development studio focused on education and social impact. Um, we also are sharing tonight our uh, 2004 report, Taking Responsibility in the Age of AI, which defines systems thinking as an urgent challenge for organizations today. So Cheryl will give some remarks for about a half an hour, and I will mo moderate the Q&A. I know all of you who have read and appreciated Cheryl's book have many, many questions. So I have a long list, but I urge you all and I know you know I'm looking at you, to ask these awesome questions. What a great chance you have here to have Cheryl in the flesh. Thank you, Cheryl. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mara. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah? OK. I, I have a special microphone that's attached to me. Um, so. I'm Cheryl Kababa, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the author of Closing the Loop, Systems Thinking for Designers, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about the intersection of equity-centered design and systems thinking. And I'm honored to be part of this speaker series um, dedicated to Lucas Daniels, who I feel, you know, um, would love what I'm about to talk about today. Um, so, Substantial is a design research and strategy consultancy based in Seattle, and when I'm not consulting, I'm also teaching. So I teach at the University of Washington's Human Centered Design and Engineering program. Um, and so, you know, talking to students is close to my heart. I get what Maura just did because I would do the same thing to my own <laughs> students. Um, so bring those questions towards me. <laughs> Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm the author of Closing the Loop, System Thinking for Designers, and um, I have a discount code if any of you are interested in purchasing the book, um, Institute, which is the first name of uh, your fine institution. Um, so I just want to start off by saying I'm someone whose career has been foundationally impacted by design thinking. And you, this is my own sort of rendition of the typical five-part design thinking process, which many of you are familiar with. Design thinking is often represented in this way, popularized by IDEO and the Stanford D School, um, or as the double diamond that's been popularized by the UK Design Council. Um, and I'm sure many of you have used it in your work, um, your day-to-day -day work, and are familiar with it. Um, and this process and philosophy but there's a lot of flaws to design thinking in the user-centric way in which it's deployed. Um, I really love this image from Erica Hall, who many of you are, are also familiar with. Um, she wrote Just Enough Research, kind of talking about the role of UX or experience design um, as it applies to, you know, kind of like the eventual impact that it'll have. Um, often what that means is, as designers, we tend to design for the direct benefit of use in the moment for an individual user. And when you think about, just kind of like think about some of the digital solutions or you know, experiences that we see every day. Um, social media is a good example where you have things like infinite scroll, the kinds of things that delight you in the moment or are nice for an individual user in the moment, but have you know, kind of broad ranging, potentially negative impact. Um, and part of that is because there is a disconnect between the um, broader imperative or like the business models of these kinds of products and what designers are doing when they call themselves, when they call it UX. Um, and so I think an antidote to this in many ways is systems thinking. Um, Essentially, it allows us to make connections that are not necessarily inherent uh, to the traditional design thinking process. Um, 
thinking about systems forces us to consider beyond the direct benefit of use. Um, this means going beyond individual users, their context, and their use of products and services. Um, and in order to be on the same page about what we mean when we talk about systems thinking, we need to have a shared definition of what a system is. I'm sure many of you in this program are familiar with Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows. Um, and the way she describes it is, a system is more than the sum of its parts. It may exhibit adaptive, dynamic, goal-seeking, self-preserving, and sometimes evolutionary behavior. So it's an interconnected set of elements that are coherently organized in order to achieve something. Um, and this makes them fairly dynamic, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and to simplify it, if you think about what you need to consider as a designer, um, I view systems thinking as there's three concepts that you need to use to broaden your lens. One is interconnectedness, so just thinking about the ways things are connected, maybe that are not immediately um, obvious or at the surface level. Causality, so that's thinking not about what you just want to intend to happen, but what will happen as a result of that and what will happen as a result of that, so secondary and tertiary effects. Um, and then wholeness, so broadening your idea of what a system actually is. Um, and one metaphor that I really like when we think about the difference between sort of maybe traditional design and systems thinking is clouds and clocks. So in the 70s, the philosopher Karl Popper, he described two types of problems, cloud problem, clock problems and cloud problems. Um, when you think about clocks, like a physical clock, uh, there are clear elements that work together. You can take it apart and put it back together. You can isolate and reduce problems based on the com components involved. Um, clouds, on the other hand, are literally nebulous. They move in our dynamic. Uh, they're complex systems that are interconnected. You know, anyone who's seen the diagrams when you're in primary school of, you know, how the rain system is connected, that's clouds. And then they also adapt and change. Um, and the thing is that in a lot of environments, designers might be working within engineering cultures, and technology organizations have cultures that are based on engineering. We take the same reductionist view um, that the things we're working on are clocks. But I think when we think about increased scale, complexity, interdependency, a lot of the things that we're actually trying to solve for are a lot of the problem spaces are actually clouds. And if you kind of use that sort of mindset to expand your thinking, it also involves thinking about power structures and incentives, which leads me to the idea of taking an equity-centered approach in design. So, um, you know, there's an intersection of these two things, the design practice and how our design processes and equity. Um, there's a famous image that shows three children trying to look over a fence at a baseball game. Has, that, has anyone seen this? Yeah, and it's supposed to describe equity where the shortest child um, is standing on a bunch of boxes in order to be able to see over the fence. There are a lot of problems with this image, but it's not a terrible introduction to those who might be unfamiliar with the idea of equity versus equality, um, because those boxes represent additional resources or actions that would allow somebody who has fewer resources to be able to have equal footing. So um, one way to describe equity is fairness across difference, uh, as well as the elimination of race and socioeconomic status as predictors of success. And there are other marginalizing factors, of course, when we're thinking about the intersection of equity and design. You can think about designing for those with disabilities, um, as well as like other types of, of status that might create a less equal experience for people. I also want to emphasize that inclusion is not the same as equity. Um, in my practice, we've tried to reduce the use of the word inclusion or inclusive design. And while equity expresses fairness across difference, in some ways, 
it also means questioning the status quo when it comes to who holds power. And inclusion still centers those who hold power by centering the act of including. And so it's a way to sort of push the dialogue a little bit further in terms of the design process in itself and who holds power is to kind of think about, am I engaging in just inclusion or am I actually engaging in equity? Um, so that said, equity-centered design interrogates the problems of user-centered design by acknowledging the position of the designer and striving for more equitable outcomes. Um, it actually questions design, it just interrogates the role it plays in power structures and seeks to empower end users and end beneficiaries during the process of design and development. And within my practice, we don't, um, we also try not to use the term end users. Like we think about system stakeholders or we think about lived experts when we're conducting um, participatory design or co-design, which I will also talk about a little bit. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this. It's a power and positionality wheel. Uh, it shows one's proximity uh, to power using a sociocultural lens. And as you're working on projects, this one is taken from the Canadian Council for Refugees, and I often do this exercise with teams that I'm working with. So the, uh, the inner circle um, holds the most proximity to power while the outer circle holds the least. And there are many different formats of this depending on the sociocultural context that you're coming from. Um, this one is very North American, for example. But this exercise is really good because you, know, you, you should be thinking about the most marginalized of your system stakeholders. So for example, I do a lot of work in education. So we have to think about those who are least served by today's systems. And where I'm from, that means children of immigrants, black and Latina children, and children experiencing poverty. Um, now think about where you sit on the wheel versus the most marginalized of those who are considered end users or end beneficiaries of your design solutions. And this is what it means to start noticing and reflecting on inequities in your work and among your stakeholders. Um, it's really a question of who historically holds power versus those who don't, and trying to change and shift that in your work. So the National Equity Project created this liberatory design framework, and it's interesting because in many ways it's um, it reiterates the design thinking process with a couple more steps that integrate participatory design, but at the center of it is notice and reflect because that's the role of the designer. It's how do you recognize your own power and privilege and how it affects your design solution, and reflecting means reflecting and unpacking what you've done so that you can change it for next time. So why do we want to take systems thinking and combine it with equity-centered design? Um, as opposed to just designing things the way that privileged people want them or the way that things make the most money. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this quote from William Gibson, the future is already here, is just not very evenly distributed. And I think in order to truly design for the future, we need to consider the long-term implications for everyone and not just the wealthy few. Um, and the correction of current inequities requires systemic change. So, it's funny because I'm, I'm also a parent. I have four kids. And when we talk about school, um, I often talk to them about sticking it to the man. <laughs> so how do you stick it to the man in a way that is like not necessarily just maintaining the status quo and doing you know, what dominant culture wants, um, but you know, that kind of aligns with creating a more equitable world it's fundamentally disrupting the status quo, not just working in service of it. Um, so I've been thinking about this quote a lot in my work where, uh, I, think, I don't know who to attribute this to, but it's been kicking around Twitter for a few years. Dystopian fiction is when you take things that happen in real life to marginalize populations and apply them to people with privilege. And I think about this at least once a week through my work, um, things that I'm reading. Uh, I recently read Ada Ferrer's Cuba and American History, and there was kind of like a fact in her writing that, um, that really resonated with me and made me think of this. She said, in the 30 years after Columbus arrived in what is now Cuba in 1492, 80 to 90% of the local Taino population was dead. 
And it was from a variety of causes, new disease, famines, massacres. And it made me think, just think about if 80% of everyone around you were dying. That's literally an apocalypse. That is dystopia. And the image here is from one of my favorite science fiction movies, Interstellar, where the dust storms on Earth are making Earth uninhabitable. Um, but this is happening already. It's just in places that where the privileged can view it as far away. The UN says it's literally a crisis that's happening right now. Um, and I keep thinking, for example, about the moment we're in when it comes to AI. AI can further drive existing inequalities or it can meaningfully close equality gaps. And we as designers are in a position to help set the direction. Um, yeah, it's, it's really crazy. Every time I go to a conference, an education conference, it's just like, oh, where are all the people at when it comes to the talks? It's like any talk where somebody has AI in the title is where the people are going to be. And oftentimes, it's, they're just talking about what are the possibilities of this technology and what are the amazing things it can do and not necessarily talking about or thinking about the limitations. And so I think leading with the limitations and thinking strategically about it is a role that designers can play. So I have a few principles that you know, we incorporate in my practice around systems thinking and equity-centered design. Uh, the first is to make the invisible visible. Um, I love this because Mara like, mentioned earlier to me that this is a tenet um, in how she teaches systems thinking. Um, and so I was like, oh my gosh, that's my first principle. Uh, start trying to see systems. Oftentimes they exist in your day to day and we don't really recognize it. Um, and you know, one example that I use for folks who kind of don't totally like understand what I'm talking about is, um, there was this great story a couple years ago in National Geographic that focused on the unequal distribution of trees in some cities. So for example, in LA, uh, you can have an area with almost no trees, and then you'll have another area that has lots of trees. And what's interesting is that these images are from the same street. They just happen to be a few miles away from each other. And when there are heat waves, um, something that is increasing in today's world, uh, trees in neighborhoods can cool surface temperatures by up to 25 degrees Celsius. Um, these neighborhoods also have very different demographics. The first image is from Koreatown, which is a mostly Latino and Asian um, population. And the image on the opposite side is of um, Los Feliz, where it's mostly a white population. Um, and areas with fewer trees also have lower property values. These disparate paths are formed by discriminatory attitudes that people are worth, some people are worth more than others. Um, and then they also connect to structures, policies that reinforce and codify that racism and discrimination. So for example, one of the reasons that there are certain areas in LA that have fewer trees is because it makes those areas easier to surveil by helicopter. And so this is literally a policy connected to a discriminatory bias against a certain population. And this is all made visible by noticing that trees are in some places and not others. Um, and it reminds you that all of these things are connected. So this is the state framework. Um, and you can basically look at any problem space <laughs> through this lens where you kind of think about what are the sociocultural implications, the technical, technological, environmental, economic, and political implications. Um, I, I work with a lot of technology organizations. And I will tell you that they're often not thinking in this way. Um, and when you bring that to the table, it actually opens up the opportunities for different ways to solve problems and not just the ways they were initially thinking about. So in addition, if you're kind of trying to make the invisible visible, you can figure out the root cause of why things are the way they are. So oftentimes when I'm working with organizations, I use the iceberg model because you can have an understanding of what the quote unquote events are, um, which you know in the previous example it would be hey, I see trees in some neighborhoods and not others. And below that are the patterns and trends that cause those events. Below that is the structure or infrastructure that causes the patterns and trends. And then below that are the mental models 
that sort of have a relationship with everything above. And doing this with folks who are oftentimes just thinking at the surface level about how to solve things. For example, you know, when I've used that um, trees example um, with teams, sometimes they'll just be like, well, why can't they just plant more trees in those neighborhoods? Oh, that doesn't account for all the things that sit below that. Um, and you can, this is not meant to be read, but you can use this method for all sorts of analyses to surface what lies beneath the surface when it comes to interconnections. So for example, I ran this exercise with an organization that was just thinking about the attrition within their company. And at the bottom, they were really starting to get into the mental models of it all, such as, you know, this idea of work is my family is shifting. And so I think at first they were just like, oh, people are leaving because they don't like that they can't work from home. But as we did this analysis, it was easier for them to see where the true problems were, as well as what are the things that are causing the problems that are immediately obvious to them. Um, my second principle is remember that today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. This is actually a tenet from uh, Peter Senge, the fifth discipline, which is a classic in organizational change management and systems thinking. Um, outcomes of change can be both intended and unintended, so we need to work to define how one thing leads to another and where circularity exists. Um, one of my favorite examples is a historical example about perverse incentives. So in 1902, the French colonial Hanoi had a rat problem, and the government there, um, part of it was because they decided to put sewers in sort of the wealthy French area so that there could be indoor plumbing, but of course the sewers were a heaven for rats in the tropical weather. Um, and so the colonial government created a plan to eradicate the rat population, and their solution was to hire local Vietnamese residents as rat hunters and pay them for each dead rat tail turned in. That worked for a while, but then after a while, the rat tails started increasing, and they're like, why are there more rats? And what they found out, and so as a result, they're like, okay, well, we're going to increase the bounty, which is a crazy, it's just like a ridiculous thing to do. So they found out that people were cutting the rat tails off and just like setting the rats free so that they could continue breeding. But then on top of that, people are actually creating rat farms outside of the city <laughs> so that they could just continue to cut the tails off and you know bring them in. And it's a story about how people can be incentivized in a way that thwarts the outcomes that you're, you're seeking. This is known as a perverse incentive. Um, and this is prevalent, particularly in complex systems with um, strong power differentials between people in the system. So in addition to collecting the bounties, um, you can look at the rat farming and harvesting as a way for the you know, local Vietnamese population under this terribly oppressive colonizer government as um, a way of sticking it to them. Like it was a way of sort of reinforcing their own power. Now here's a causal loop about that. <laughs> so you have an increase in the rat population. So they increased the bounty per rat which led to an increase in rat farming and then led to an increase in the rat population. So as you can see, it's a vicious cycle, you might say. Um, and basically thinking about how the way we think we're solving problems that leads to other problems is a good way to keep our collective arrogance in check and to put us in the mindset of creating opportunities to mitigate the new problems as well as innovate and potentially prevent them. And again, we're constantly thinking and talking about power structures and incentives. Um, so this is a causal loop diagram that I worked on at one point, um, but I haven't done a ton of these lately because one of the things that we do now is we do the analysis with our stakeholders, and so we use um, more simplified ways of representing systems, uh, which leads me to uh, my last principle, which is diversify and empower your stakeholders. Um, this starts with knowing who you are, your powers and your biases, and knowing that you're not agnostic to the, to the problem space. So we talk about this as your positionality as a designer. You're not neutral, uh, so acknowledging that is a start um, to diversifying perspectives in your work. 
Um, I once had this European collaborator and we were working together on a US-based education project whose methods were based, and his methods were based in design thinking. And he said to me, you know what, I don't really need to kind of learn about the system that we're in. Um, I'm agnostic to it, I just, I just use design thinking. I just come in and use design thinking. And I was just like, that is so arrogant. Like just this idea that you can parachute in and design for some other community because you have this five part process at your disposal. And um, yeah, I was like, that, that's not gonna work for me. So uh, we, you know, we were trying to educate him on equity centered design. I think it was something that hadn't occurred to him, that you could not just like blow in and design for somebody else. Um, and I think that's what we mean by the participatory principle. So Mike Jackson, who wrote uh, Toward a System of System Methodologies, he describes this as the participative principle. And what he says is, if possible, all the stakeholders should participate in the various phases of the process. Stakeholders here include representatives of the purposeful parts of the system and the larger system. Um, so this also means engaging stakeholders like lived experts in designing for the future. So he says again, the idealized future is a statement of the system um, of planners and stakeholders would create if they were free to create any system they wanted. Um, and I think this is like an interesting principle because I think oftentimes designers say they are engaging in design research or user research, but that's oftentimes a really extractive position. Like you're just taking kind of people's context and using your expertise to design um, whereas di designing with community gets you very different results and very different understanding of the problem space, but also the ideas that come out of it could be very different. Um, who here has worked on personas? Have you ever created personas? Um, yeah, so I, I think, I'm not going to speak for the entire design practice and say like we shouldn't be creating personas, but um, I found it really hard to create personas within my practice because they tend to flatten and make users less human, if that makes sense. So what we do instead is we do co-design research outputs like persona toolkits or like sort of compo um, component-based personas um, because we're doing this work with lived experts. And we call our research participants lived experts because we're actually engaging in the design process with them. So this puts lived experts and the representatives from those communities on my team in an empowered position and also forces organizations that we work with to engage with lived experts at every turn of the design process. Um, and so, um, you know, an example of something that we did instead of personas is create the components so that organizations and lived experts can work together to kind of understand context, which is something persona is supposed to do for you. Um, and the other thing about like engaging, um, you know, what we might call end users or lived experts in the design process, the actual ideation and design process and not just collecting their data and stories, um, is that it's fun. My team does a lot of work with primary and secondary school students. And this, for example, is from a project in which uh, we worked with students to imagine the future of math. So we gave them an opportunity to, to design a branch of the multiverse with, uh, you know, inspiration from Spider-Man, from shows like Loki, to imagine the future they would want. So kind of like adhering to that participative principle that Mike Jackson talks about in designing a system of system methodologies. Um, and this manifested in a project I did with the Gates Foundation, uh, US programs education team, where lived experts informed an investment strategy about changing Algebra 1. Algebra 1 is a either a gateway course or a gatekeeper course for students. And oftentimes for the most historically marginalized students, it's a gatekeeper course that prevents you from achieving what you want educationally. Um, and the, the Gates Foundation, they went to the project hypothesizing that there were probably specific, mainly digital products that could help solve for this. But after engaging in ideation with lived experts, students and teachers from under-resourced communities, as well as you know, researchers and experts within the system of education, 
um, and equity experts, they realized that there were many avenues that needed to be pursued, like uh, you know, strengthening teacher practices or reimagining tests and assessments. Um, or even creating support systems. And so focusing on equity through participation allowed for a more holistic view of systemic change. So keeping in mind the idea of expanding your uh, idea of stakeholders and involving them in the process, we might return to this five-part design thinking process. Now, when I think about systems thinking and how it might intersect with this, I think there are many different avenues in which problems can be solved. And so if you're, engaged, if you're combining these things, you first have to expand your idea of what a problem space is or what you're actually trying to solve for. You need to imagine different points of leverage. Um, and this is where as you're working on things like your systems maps, you're identifying those points of leverage. Um, and then there's multiple ways that this could go into the design process or not. What's not represented here is that there are things like policy that may need to change that are not actually part of a design process. And then lastly, you need to evaluate. So consider what's working, what isn't, which of today's solutions are already causing tomorrow's problems, and then you go back and repeat the process all over again. Um, I was really excited because earlier I popped into Kim Irwin's, uh, I would talk to Kim Irwin who's teaching a metrics class and I was like, ooh, that is like that evaluate phase right there. So just to sum up the principles, uh, continue to make the invisible visible. Remember that today's problems come from yesterday's solutions and diversify and empower your stakeholders. And I think these are all good ways of sort of combining that uh, sort of Venn diagram of equity center design and systems thinking. Um, systemic change is necessary. And I love this term freedom dreaming. Dr. Bettina Love, who um, writes about educational freedom, coined the term and she describes it as dreaming about a system that's free from today's oppression. And I think that's what we need to do when we adopt a systems thinking mindset is dream about and move the needle towards systemic change. Um, Ruha Benjamin also, she's about to come out with a book about imagination and kind of talks about how sort of the, a similar concept, freeing ourselves from oppression means engaging in imagination as we're kind of thinking about the future. Um, so hopefully that inspires you to integrate both equity center design, and I know many of you are already integrating systems thinking. And uh, yeah, um, let me know if you have any questions. Very good. Look at that applause. Thank you, Cheryl. That yeah. was fantastic. Um, I have been very stimulated, as I'm sure so many of you have been too, by not only her resourceful, you know, many, many exciting sources that she cites so effectively, right, all you research students, but these key points that I think are made so well. Um, I have a set of questions, but I'm sure you all do too. Is somebody really eager to ask a question? Yes? Because we have Leslie and me. Um, Okay, I'm gonna start. Cheryl, uh, your first principle, making the invisible visible, um, is very exciting for many of our students and for many design practitioners because um, frameworking, um, showing the many dimensions and factors and elements at play and how they interact is just, it's, a, it's love for many of our designers, right? We're really excited to visualize and communicate how these systems are functioning. But when we do that, and I think we saw that in the, um, in the iceberg model that you gave us, that example, I don't know why I'm breaking up, um, it's kind of overwhelming. Like when you see the system, you go, oh, wow, this is complicated. There's a lot here. And especially when you're working in close partnership with um, people, lived experts, which I think is so beautiful, what do you do when everyone strikes that moment of over? How do we navigate the sometimes emotional burdens of, oh my God, this is a lot. This is, this is overwhelming. How do, you, how do you manage those situations? Yeah, it's really interesting, especially 
working with organizations, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, who might have a hypothesis about how to create change, and they're like, oh, there's, gonna, there's this silver bullet. It's AI for tutoring or something like that. And, and then you do kind of like a systems analysis, and it's a little bit like, what? There's all of these other problems. Um, but I think, I actually think it's a really like clarifying activity because it sometimes prevents organizations from investing in the wrong thing because then they can understand where there might be points of failure as well. If you even just understand the interconnection between the different stakeholders within a system, that can be overwhelming. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, I work in education, and you can do just a stakeholder map that is just bananas. Like it will have policymakers, it will have ed tech organizations, it will have school districts, it'll have test providers, um, and then you know, kind of like at the very center of that is like teachers and students. And I think um, knowing that these, there are all those different players actually helps you target where you can actually have impact. And I think that's the thing to remember, is like you as a stakeholder or as an individual or as a singular organization, you're never going to be able to problem solve for all those things. You might be able to bring the right people together so that they can take different avenues, which is why a lot of my projects involve bringing in different stakeholders like policymakers so that um, there is actual alignment and understanding among the people who have the potential to make change. Um, and I think that actually helps. So even if you feel overwhelmed by these sort of like complex systems that you're grappling with, I think that's one way of alleviating that overwhelm is get other people involved who actually know about the leverage points in that space. Um, even if you've already done the analysis, it's like, oh, we should really talk to you know, this one nonprofit that has um, you know, experience within doing this kind of work within a community. And like, that, that really helps because they're like, oh, this is what you can do. It opens the doors for innovation, I think. Thank you. Over to you. Yes, a beer. Hi, my name is Abir. Uh, so while you were speaking, I have like a lot of questions, especially when it comes to system design. It's very complicated and complex, and I, it's I still got like I got introduced to it one semester ago. So I'm not a, a like an expert when it comes to systems, but. Um, at least while growing up, I've seen a lot of systems fail, uh, whether it was historical or something like happening in our current timeline. Uh, so I was wondering, um, because we're kind of pitching that uh, systems design is kind of the next thing to go to when it comes to solving uh, problems. Um, but is there um, any like school of thought that acknowledge that every system has a lifespan that would probably come to an end. Uh, as you said, that uh, uh, today's problems is yesterday's solutions. So even if we enhance the way that we think, I think we would reach uh, an optimal state. And then because of the optimal state, we're going to deteriorate it and then you know, loop into the problem that we need to fix again. Mm -hmm. The shelf life of systems. Oh, that's really interesting. I think um, <laughs> I think that is maybe an acknowledgement that systems are clouds, right? They're always shifting, like they're not static things. And so, for example, I did this. Um, I did this massive, I think I showed like a screenshot of it, a massive systems map a few years ago on the impact of Facebook on communities. And that was almost immediately old as soon as I finished it and wrote the paper about it. And I think part of it is because the system had shifted and changed. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I think it just means 
continual sort of analysis or like focal points in terms of like where change can happen within a system. I, like I, I sort of, I don't know, maybe there are schools of thought that say there is like system death, but um, I kind of think like systems change shape and that they move on to kind of something slightly different. It's an incremental thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know that that changes the form of analysis except to continually analyze it, right? And keep understanding when these big shifts happen in the status quo. Yeah, you started out talking a little bit about consciousness. I was writing down the systems consciousness mm. and that sort of alertness to how those dynamics evolve and change is, I think, a critical piece, yeah. whether they're on the upswing or the down. Right. Who else has a question? Sai has a question. Oh, you gave, okay. Welcome, thank you. Hello. What's uh, your name? My name is Ray. Hi, Ray. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, Cheryl. Uh, I think my question is around the limitations of when to know when you're the right designer for a project. And uh, I think you be began to poke the holes in, in what design thinks of as agnosticism or, or you know, you can parachute into a problem and, and offer some value. And I think I'm finding more and more as a designer and, and as a facilitator, like the limits of uh, knowing uh, of my, my ability to contribute into certain systems or like how much knowledge do you need about the system to be able to facilitate uh, a design session or um, working group and or even uh, if you're the right person identity wise to be guiding certain conversations or uh, yeah, when when is it when is it the right moment to pass it to somebody else who is more familiar with a particular context? Yeah, that's such a good question and totally relevant to the space of equity centered design because you're not always it definitely the the process or the method kind of acknowledges that it, in terms of your positionality, you might not be the right person to kind of be creating design solutions. Um, and so the way I sort of, I didn't really touch on this, but the way I lately describe my role as a designer is as a facilitator for other people's knowledge and abilities to enact design. Um, and part of that is because I'm not always a member of the communities for which I'm expected to engage in the design process for. And so, um, we oftentimes have people on my team that are cultural moderators. So they are, you know, members of the communities for which we're supposed to be kind of like doing the analysis and um, doing participatory design uh, and have a background, um, not just like in terms of their positionality, but also demographically um, and other factors. Um, and we also, we don't just work with lived experts who are within the communities for which, you know, design change is happening. It's, we also engage um, experts. So people like academic experts who have a lot of experience in the space um, and who understand that intersection of equity. Um, I think some of like the worst, there's a lot of like harms that design process has caused I think about an example from my work sometimes where I was talking to somebody, I was doing a lot of work in global health and I was talking to somebody from a nonprofit and they were, they said, oh, did you know in all these field offices for like the different philanthropies, um, there are literally warehouses full of, um, you know, failed interventions in places like Nairobi, right? And um, I think, that is part of that approach that I talked about earlier where it's like the arrogance of a designer and it's not just design practitioners, it's obviously like all of these people who think they can just kind of like come into a community and problem solve there without engagement from those who are expected to be like using their solutions. Um, and it's such a waste of time, energy and resources. So I think part of it is like just getting to the space where you're like, am I, I mean, that's already growth is being like, am I the right person to be doing this work? Um, 
And not only that, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's like a definitive answer about when to pass on something and pass it on to some, somebody else. Um, I mean, we've done that sort of thing in our own practice where we've passed work on to another organization or a nonprofit that can do that work better than we can. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a decision that you have to make either interpersonally or within your organization. Thank you, Ray. Azra has a question. Oh, but let's ask Daniela first. Welcome, Daniela. Hi. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, I am Daniela Vélez. So um, it is an honor. Like, we read your book last semester, and now have you, having you here in person, thank you. Oh, so I am you. currently pursuing my master's in design plus my master's in public administration. and. So far, what I have, I have encountered is a lack of imagination of the future possibilities mm -hmm. in policy. So my question is, how, like, how can we make people believe that something is possible <laughs> within <laughs> the policy sector? Like, I, yeah. I, oh my gosh, I love this question because it's a big reason that I wrote about speculative design at the end of my book, because I think there are these narrative forms of storytelling as well as, um, yeah, like illustrating the possibility is actually so powerful. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm working on this current project. We're actually gonna release it uh, in two weeks um, about modernizing math. And we were working with students to imagine the future of math 10 to 15 to 20 years out. And that was so fun and engaging that we were literally generating, I mean, I, I, can, I can understand the irony in this. We were, we were generating images in mid-journey to kind of show what that future might look like to the different stakeholders and sort of based on what students were imagining. And I think this is um, work that's intended to go to policymakers. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is an intersection of using the visual nature of design and the kind of storytelling involved that can sort of change assumptions and narratives. Um, I love this, uh, there's this design researcher Luisa Prado Delo Martins, and um, I wrote about her in the chapter on speculative design because she talks about who engages in futurism. And she said, if all of the futures are imagining, we're imagining involve you know white middle class people, what has happened to all the minorities? And it's this is why it's so nice to take that lens of equity-centered design and working with lived experts to engage in the process of speculating and um, uh, doing futurist work. Um, and I think just being able to visualize that in some way, whether it's videos or narrative storytelling or just images, um, I think is helpful for those kinds of stakeholders who you're saying like lack imagination. Um, yeah, we've definitely had to work with the kinds of people who are, you know, like they're literally in a spreadsheet or Word document like all the time and it's really rare they get to engage in that work. And if you bring them into workshops where they're engaging in that kind of work, it's like so exciting for them. So um, yeah, I think it's like, use your design power of like being able to bring that side of the practice into working with those stakeholders and maybe it'll spark their imagination. Ezra, Ezra has a question. Uh, hi, my name is Ezra. Thank you for the beautiful lecture and I think this tied up really nicely because uh, I'm a PhD student. I am fascinated with the power and influence of narratives in driving systems change. So like while you we were talking, there is this a lot of glancing and winking happening <laughs> at the back. Uh, but yeah, so um, I'm 
really struck by the deeper levels of system change that involves our mental models and mindsets and norms and the kind of narratives that informs how an organization thinks about systems change. That's like the deeper, maybe most transformative, but at the same time, the most resistant layer. Uh, so I was wondering, like, when you work with organizations and it comes to a challenge at that level, uh, how do you go about um, countering that or like getting people to think about it because it's almost an existential yeah. moment that speaks to the very perhaps the root of the organization and cultivating that change doesn't happen in a moment but it's a process so I was just wondering how you go about that in your work yeah it's a it's a tricky it's a tricky space to work in because oftentimes when you're doing that sort of like systems analysis. Um, one of the jokes that one of my former colleagues had about me is because like, yeah, all your projects end up in the space of because capitalism. And I was like, you're not wrong <laughs> about that. But, um, but yeah, that comes up. It's like, well, what do you do? It's like capitalism is there. And through the course of this particular project, you're not going to change the system of capitalism. Um, one of my answers to that is awareness is the first step. <laughs> Not everybody knows that it's because capitalism. So I think there is some sort of awareness sparking that happens when you do the kind of analysis that ends up in the mental model space, even if you're not going to be able to, you know, quote unquote, do anything about it through the course of like your project or program work. Um, but sometimes, you can sort of do something about those mental models um, depending on what you're focused on. So, you know, if I'm focused on a project that's rooted in education, I think the Algebra One project that I shared is a good example of that. There are some things that people maybe just like don't acknowledge are that fall into that mental model space. One that math is taught in this super um, white dominant way that is historically white dominant, despite the origins of a lot of mathematical processes um, having been invented in India or the Middle East um, and in many different places, um, include, yeah, South America. And it's kind of like, well, what if there are little things that started shifting those mental models? What if we created more like culturally relevant avenues for students to learn. And so there are ways that you can use like the upper levels of the iceberg to, or create a theory of change that actually integrates some of the beginnings or the incremental mental model work. Um, and so I like to think about it in that way, like you're not going to shift, like completely shift an entire society's mental models, but you can kind of chip away at it once you understand what needs to change. Uh, size next, and then you. Cool. Sorry, who? Size next. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, hello, Cheryl. Thank you for the talk. I learned quite a lot. Uh, so currently, we're doing a lot of systems work in ID, and I'm someone who's still gaining a lot of competency in it. And when it comes to systems, we often talk about leverage points, right? Uh, but we map out these models of systems, and we try to identify leverage points. But when I look back at the model, I often find that it's driven a lot more by my intuition than I'd like it to be, right? Mm -hmm. I think the old saying is all models are false, but some might be useful. Uh, I wanted to understand in your experience what is the art or the practice of better identifying leverage points in a system? Yeah, that's a really good question because I know when I was starting out or you know, kind of like engaging in systems thinking as a design practitioner, I was having kind of like those same issues, including like where does the edge of the system live and you know, uh, yeah, what constitutes like a good leverage point versus not, and I think what shifted was, uh, I don't do that individually or even with just my team anymore. We really try to have a diverse um, 
I guess, like subset of system stakeholders to kind of do that work with us. And that allows us to validate what actually is a leverage point that can happen <laughs> versus not. Because oftentimes those are the decision makers or those are the people who are going to take action. And so they can help us determine whether that actually is a leverage point or not. And sometimes we do a little bit of the work up front so we can be like, hey, this is where we think the possibilities for change can happen. And um, yeah, you're humbled real quick because they'll just be like, absolutely not. Are you kidding me? Um, and But then kind of like working through that, I think you'll find actual places where change can happen. And I know it's like, it's harder work, right? to basically engage all of these different types of stakeholders at every turn. It takes longer, it's potentially more expensive, but it is really, really valuable because um, the way that I describe it to people who are resistant because it takes longer and it's more expensive is like, well, but it's going to unlock points of innovation. Like it'll unlock these different places where you didn't know you could have impact or maybe invest in that will have a lot of impact. So I think the key is really doing it with others whose maybe intuition is better than yours. Yeah, Edward, you're next. Oh, sure, Cheryl. Yep. Um, this is Nijo, Dean. Yep. Um, so my question is a little controversial, so I'm, I'm going to posit it in any way. Um, isn't there an, a complex con interconnection between systems design privilege and power? So for example, I did want an opportunity to point out how beautiful the cover of your book is. It is showing how the book itself is part of a larger system through showing the paper, the wood, the terrain, the earth, and all of that. But if you're inherently paper people, moving around in the atomic circle of paper, you actually may not know that wood exists, mm. right? Or the other way around, you may be wood people and you may not know that paper is a privilege in a way, depending on how you look at the hierarchy. So in some sense, the privilege and power enables you to take action in ways that people who don't have privilege and power cannot. And isn't it true that there's an interconnectivity and therefore it is not, it's not in the best interest of any system to get rid of privilege and power, but to question it in some sense? Mm -hmm. Would it, is it fair? Yeah, um, for, first of all, I think you unlocked the metaphor of the cover of my book for me. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought of that paper as like the start, it's the starting point of understanding systems. And yeah, it's surrounded by systems. I prefer your metaphors. I'm like, oh, that's the one I'm using from now on. Um, so the privilege of actually engaging in systemic change. I think, um, yeah, it, I mean, I think it does reinforce in some ways the status quo, right? Like the same people who have the power to analyze the system to kind of figure out where the leverage points are, are oftentimes the same people who hold power enough to make change. And I think that's part of, um, I think that's why I'm so interested in, in sort of intersecting systems thinking with equity-centered design, because if you truly are doing the work of shifting power structures, then you should be putting the actual work of design or change in the hands of those who typically don't, aren't empowered to do that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think a lot, for example, about Antoinette Carroll's um, community-centered design practice. Um, and it's really orienting design within the communities that are seeking change. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think there's like necessarily an immediate shift because in order to kind of do the analysis, you need to have enough privilege to be like, like you're saying, to, to know the paper and to like be aware of the paper to begin with. But 
you as somebody who is holding the paper can use that power to kind of, I don't know, pass the paper on to somebody else, I guess. I don't know if that's answering your question or not. Yeah, go ahead. But it does permeate the idea that you need to know or you need to have the power to pass it on. Even the, yes. the, the, the sentence that you created says empower someone, yeah. which means you're actually, you have power, you're empowering someone. Yeah. So privilege is a part of the system itself in, in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way of, I mean, right now the shift hasn't happened, right? So like, a lot of people hold the privilege without knowing that they hold the privilege. And I think that's part of you know the initial issue is we're not at a point yet where maybe it is happening in some spaces that I'm not aware of, but I do think like in terms of you know how we're practicing design in this room, we haven't shifted the power. Um, and I think just like knowing that you hold the privilege is in some ways the first step and like figuring out where where you can where you can make that change. We have one more question, I'm sorry. And then you all have to come to the reception afterwards where we get to speak more with Cheryl. Okay, <laughs> last question. Yeah, hi, my name is Aditi and I'm, I'm very new to the design space and stuff, but I'm working on helping people with disabilities. So particularly people suffering hemiplegia. And I think a very common question that people ask for my research and I ask a lot of people is, how do you make it more accessible? Because you mentioned how yesterday's solution is today's problem. And I think one of the main problems in those, uh, when you work with people with disabilities, is that they abandon the devices or anything that you make in the design space. And I think you mentioned a little bit about it. But I want to know more about like how do we make it more accessible and make sure that it's compatible and as well as like inclusive, I guess. Yeah, um, do you mean like how do you make devices more accessible or the? Uh, I guess devices, but like the whole uh, whole system around like uh, when you work for people with disabilities is very marginalized, I would say. Yeah. So like how do you make it more compatible, accessible, and more user-centered for them? Yeah, okay, so one of the things that we do, because I don't, I, I don't consider myself an expert in sort of, um, yeah, designing for those with, with different disabilities. Um, we engage other organizations that have that expertise, kind of like depending on what we're designing for. So if there are um, other kind of like design firms or, um, you know, for example, designing for assistive technologies. Um, there's this organization called uh, Fable that has expertise in sort of testing um, for accessible and assistive technologies. And finding those kinds of stakeholders who do have that expertise and are rooted in that community and also have representation from that community, I think is how you go about it. Because I think the problems stem from Again, like trying to design for another group or another community for whom you don't have like the background or um, full understanding. And not to say that you can't be part of that process, but I think part of it is shifting your lens in terms of what your role is as a designer. And maybe it's sort of, you know, as I mentioned before, kind of like shifting your role from like designing a thing into facilitating other people's knowledge so that they can design the thing. And so, um, yeah, I would say, you know, as part of like one of my principles is like diversify your stakeholders and make sure that they are not just part of the process, but are maybe even driving the process. All right, everybody, please join me in thanking Cheryl for this lovely conversation. <laughs>
Thank you for the great questions. Uh, we do have a reception for folks here, so please join us for a little reception. Cheryl will um, sell a few of the books that remain, and if you are first in line, even maybe write uh, a little uh, I dedication will, signature. Yes, I will sign it autograph. for you. I have um, nine books. I counted them. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, so run down. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Please join us for the reception.